Hi, right. Chris. Chris talks the most. So, so the reason why we have this set up is that we can uh, interrupt each other whenever we need to. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for a very functional installment of Club Buffett Talks, the only podcast where everyone is uh, is completely knowledgeable of everything that's ever happened, and there are no technical problems ever. My name is Chris. Uh, I'm an instruction librarian and your host today. And I'm Joseph, and I am also an instruction librarian. Joining us in the studio, we've got... Want to introduce yourselves? I'm Ryan Samuelson, and I don't know what I do anymore. It's been one of those days. And I'm, uh, John, and I'm John Schultz. I'm a <laughs> professor in the English department and uh, current president of ASAT. President? Wow. That, that right. sounds really that? impressive. I mean, where do you go from president, though? Like, you, you're up. You're at the top. That's it. I, I was vice president for a couple of years before I became president. And then I passed it on to somebody else, and they were president. And then they shot it back to me. So <laughs> <laughs> We're going to ask you all about that, actually, uh, here in just a little bit. Um, well, nobody voted for you, so it's more like a, you know, it's more like a dictatorship. So That's an autocracy. <laughs> yeah. Can we turn the uh, volume up just a hair so I can hear them a little bit better? I don't know if we can or not. Let me try. Okay. Yeah. yeah I know we don't want to just bump the volume on the sound with feedback. Bar. Yeah. Like I said, we're so functional. We're, everything's great, and there are no technical uh, hiccups going on whatsoever. Nope. <sighs> so, usually at um, the very onset of our... Let me get my paper of our podcast. We like to go around and kind of just do a round robin talking about the things we've been enjoying recently and, and what we've been up to and just some minor things we want to talk about before we get into the, the main meat of the subject. Um, and this time, since you're our special guest, John, I'm going to go first because last time they didn't let me talk at all. <laughs> uh, I'm actually I'm actually kidding about that because um, I had to go back to... Um, hometown for a week so i would actually miss the first week of class um and it was just really hectic and busy came back i spent the last week completely alone so i spent so one week spent um my toddler discovered frozen so it was a whole week of watching nothing but frozen then the next week this last week uh since i was alone i was really sad and really lonely and i did nothing but watch king of the hill so that's it that's my last month Last month, Frozen and King of the Hill. Yeah. All right. Two, two widely, widely different extremes of quality. Indeed. <clears throat> I've, I've been really boring. I've, I, I'm a homeowner, so I've been doing house projects all summer. Um, we, we had a couple of dead trees in the front yard, and we had to have them removed, and um, – one of the branches came down and took out our mailbox and, and the guy was very apologetic and everything. And I said, Oh, we'll go to Walmart and get you a new mailbox and all that. And sure enough, the next day he showed up with one, but uh, we did something totally different. Uh, we kind of built our own mailbox. Ooh. Yeah. We also we... built a shed. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we got one of those uh you, you know outdoor sheds for all of your yard work stuff, you know, lawnmowers and leaf blowers and all that. And it came in a box. And, oh. and so we had to bolt it together. <laughs> uh now were you able to get that like hooked to electricity or anything, or is it just like the shed where you put your stuff? Oh yeah, yeah. No, no electricity, but it, but yeah, it's uh just a shed on the side of the house. Uh, my daughter and I built it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, hmm. over two days. We took the old one out. That was, it really wasn't a shed. Somebody used uh, two parts of the fence and then put this corrugated <laughs> uh, plastic on top mm -hmm. to create a shelter of sorts. And and it was getting really, really nasty. So we, we tore that out and then we built a shed. Um she was supposed to get a job this summer and she didn't. <laughs> uh, so, so I, I, I gave her some money, you know, I, I paid her hourly for helping me build the shed. That's a job. I mean, that's, she yeah. did a task and she can say that she has that skill now. Yeah. She yeah. can go camp out in front of the Home Depot now and 
That's and, it. And yeah, on weekends job. she can get a job. You know, <laughs> do, do looking for those, you know, guys in F one fifties looking for laborers. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I mean that's that's pretty been oh when I, I bought a new refrigerator. Like oh. <laughs> like like that's a thing, but you know, it's the first refrigerator I've ever purchased. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, a brand new one, you know. I, I feel like an adult now. <laughs> <laughs> Do, does your refrigerator have special features? Um it's got an ice maker that works um it's it's got the uh, water dispenser inside not not on the door but just inside the door there's one and it's one of those french doors with the uh, freezer in the bottom in europe they call it the, the americano the americano yeah yeah so yeah, yeah i mean that's about as special as it gets you know yeah that, that seems like a good model yeah yeah it's very popular yeah yeah. And, and we got a great deal on it too. I've been dealing with homeowner stuff lately too. I just hate I I hate owning homes. I this is someone I was talking to the other day. I was like, I just hate dealing with the the lawn and the the electricity. And I had to deal with a breaker that was out or messing up for like a a month or something. And I was just like, I just hate it. I want well, to go. I feel to... guilty because I'm the one who told you you need to buy a house instead of an apartment. Yeah. No, no. My wife really wanted a house so we could raise. Like she was like, we we really want to raise kids in a house right and i was like i i don't care <laughs> i don't want to have to fix my own toilets but sure whatever uh so, so that's did you, yeah did you hire an electrician or did you get it fixed yourself uh i asked a, a friend I, I told a friend about it and, and he was um uh eager to help and then he almost made it worse so <laughs> i learned how to fix a breaker box now um but yeah that was a that was a whole ordeal and yeah now i'm just like I, I don't even i don't know i i have i have two kids i mentioned this in the podcast every single time but it's like one's two and a half and one is like nine months old and it's like i don't i don't even have time to think about the rest of the house right now so you're lucky you get to just think about how nice refrigerators are right now <laughs> well the ice cream wouldn't stay frozen in the old one so you know we had to do something yeah the the summer heat, you know, it was crazy. So oh, it was, it was terrible. Like, it was, it was. I kept on buying cold stuff, and it was melting in the freezers. So. My air conditioner couldn't handle, um, you know, like the hundred and ten degree weather. Mm -hmm. You know, our paper on campus can't handle the heat right now. Something, something like that. Like the printer is is all the printers are messing up because the paper is crinkling or something because of the heat. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. That... Yeah. But are you talking about the printer here in the library? Yeah, the, here yeah. in Clark, uh, somewhere else. Like, it's just whatever. Yeah. Like, we, we keep hearing that it's just like the printers just aren't working right now because that's actually is... a very old, old problem. When we used to fill up the printers ourselves here in the building, we had to keep them in a, in a vacuum Tupperware, basically, because um, any humidity would just mess them up. Yeah. No, my wife works over in IT. So what I heard mm -hmm. <laughs> was that the settings were adjusted on the printer to cardstock. And so oh. it was pulling in more than one oh, sheet okay. of paper mm -hmm. at the same time. And that's why it was getting clogged up. The plot thickens. Yeah. So. Well, now you have someone you can ask. if you <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> get, uh, get, a, get a number straight there. Well, again, that's one of the problems we have is a lot of times we don't know the answer to it to problems. We send people over to IT to fix them and that's yeah. the last we hear of them. We had a student last week, it was very nice to come back and go, here's the actual answer to, your, to the question I had. And we said, thank you for coming back and letting us know that's the actual answer. <laughs> um, have you been reading anything, watching anything? Oh, well, I, I wanna read James. Uh, what, what's his name, uh, Percival, oh. He he wrote uh, American Fiction. Okay, oh, uh, you know the movie that came out uh, recently. Uh, yeah, uh, and James is a retelling of Huck Finn from Jim's perspective. Oh, it I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Percival Wright, what is his name? It, it just came out in March. Uh, Percival Everett. Percival Everett. Thank you. Yeah. 
that's what that's what we do at the library we we yeah, yeah. google uh, things. Yeah. well we and, and ordinarily ryan would have done it but he's yeah. not in his office this time <laughs> yeah he's over there he's he's about to uh, i don't know what to do with myself i can't i'm not i'm not constantly looking to see if there's any, any problems any questions and i don't have one ear on the circulation desk to see what's going on over there and i'm not looking up any questions that or anything <laughs> that that arrives in uh in, in our discussion so yeah. i'm sitting here twiddling my thumbs freaking out because i have nothing to do he's chew he's about to chew through his lips because he can't google for us <laughs> you got your phone right there <laughs> oh yeah yeah that's what the, the, the google box yeah but yeah no this looks this looks great yeah yeah and then i've also been a uh, uh i'm starting a uh new online journal uh oh. for the campus uh 1922 review and oh after the uh the founding year the founding year yeah exactly so i i spent a lot of the summer coding uh the website anything specific uh that you want as far as submissions or what are you going to have what type of is there any focus for it i guess yeah it's it's creative writing for sure so uh you know short fiction creative nonfiction, poetry art um uh, i'm working with uh jason bly over in fain he's an art professor and uh uh submissions have actually closed uh for the creative work but I reopened up the art link and I sent it to him so all of his students could send me stuff. And I opened up Submittable today and I had like 20 new submissions. So that, that's absolutely wonderful. That is wonderful. Yeah. But uh, I'm teaching a graduate class on publishing and editing. And so our project is 1922 Review. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So they're, uh, right now they're reviewing all of the submissions that we already received makes your job easier too oh infinitely <laughs> and um so this last week was the first read this week is going to be the second read and uh third week will be resolving any conflicts on decisions uh but we plan on being uh, up live uh, i want to say november 18th okay keep that on your calendar then november 18th yeah actually now now, we also uh, do reviews, like book reviews, movie <laughs> reviews, and also events, uh, regional events. So things that are happening, uh, like Todd Giles' uh, mm -hmm. exhibit over in the Art Museum, uh, ASAT, which is going to be here on campus in November as well. So those kind of things. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Chris. No, no, no. I'm glad you. I'm glad you mentioned that. But uh, I did want to ask you, and this is probably this is jumping ahead a little bit. But I did want to ask you about uh, voices. Um, and now that makes me wonder if so. This is going to be a simultaneous a simultaneous uh, publishment with. Yes. With yeah. That that's the idea. With voices, I, I think everybody understands momentum, right? And people can get excited about something like voices, you know, a journal. Uh, but then once it gets published, uh, all that momentum and, and forward progress kind of gets lost. People disappear for the summer. They come back in the fall. They totally forget about it. And then the enthusiasm starts again in the spring. So the idea of the online journal was to have something a little more on the regular. So we'll do an issue in the spring and we'll do an issue in the fall, whereas Voices only does an issue in the spring. Plus okay. with an online one, you can archive them too. So you yeah. can go back through the back, uh, the back catalog. And could you tell, is, I, I seem to recall there was another, um, there's another publication, uh, Mosaic. Mm, no, that, that oh, okay. was, uh, <laughs> the multicultural center was called. Yeah. I, I seem to recall that that was something that I had heard before. And I was thinking like, how many, you have a lot of publications on your belt at the moment, but, um, Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm also the editor for JSAT and the editor for, uh, writing Texas. Okay. That's, that's, that might've been what it is then. Sorry. I got that. I got some things mixed up in my head, but that's really great. I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the, the fact that we're, we've got all of this currently being worked on. Yeah, it is a lot of work. <laughs> That's why I don't have time to read. I'm I'm busy reading other people's submissions and then coding stuff and reading on how to code and all that stuff. Well, that's amazing. Anyone else want to talk about their weeks? <laughs> no. 
<laughs> I took my dog to the groomer. Oh, oh. Nice. <laughs> yeah, hopefully she'll be nice and pretty. She better be. She yeah. better be. All right. Yeah. Um, I every month I really like to read one of our CML titles that we get in from the Junior Library Guild. Uh, and I did that again this month. It's this book that's called Evidence. Uh, and there were a couple of things about it that I thought were were interesting. Uh, at the back of it, it actually has some specific uh, information about uh, diseases and viruses. Uh, this is about a guy, the guy that figured out uh, what causes cholera. And uh, it's actually uh, timely because September 8th uh, marks the, the anniversary of when the handle came off the Broad Street pump in London. Uh, this doctor is named John Snow. So unlike some other John Snows you may have heard one <laughs> heard of, this one new stuff. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a it's a good book and it's worth checking out. Uh also uh I had checked out the streaming series uh, A Good Girl's Guide to Murder. And I really enjoyed the series. I thought it was it was uh, good. And I wondered if the, uh, I saw that it was based on a book and I thought, hey, I wonder if the book is better. So uh, unfortunately we didn't have it in our own library, but through the magic that is interlibrary loan, I was able to get it in from another library. Uh, and I just finished reading it last night. It's really good. Um, as much as I liked the TV show, I actually liked the book better. Um, it's a little bit more complicated and actually had a more satisfying ending, I thought. Uh, a Good so Girl's what now? It's A Good Girl's Guide to Murder. Okay. Um, I I don't want to say that the, the streaming service it's on, not because I, I don't want to advertise it, but I literally don't remember which one it is. <laughs> I... I think that it's Netflix, but I could be wrong about that. Uh, and what's the author's name? The The author is uh, Holly Jackson, and this is actually her first book. Wow. Um, so, yeah, I think she'll be a person to watch out for. Excellent. Uh, the uh, TV series was was good, and the, the actress that is in it, and I'm going to get this wrong too, is... Emma Myers, she played Wednesday's roommate in the Jenna Ortega Wednesday TV hmm. series. Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, so we've been doing that. And of course, uh, I've we've been doing the thing with my wife and I are reading through the, uh, the Wheel of Time series. And we're almost done with Shadow Rising. So we'll be moving on to the next book, probably within a few days. But uh, nice. yeah, that's what that's what we've been doing. Speaking of uh, Jenna Ortega, I wanted to publicly ask anyone if Beetlejuice 2 is any good, the Monica Bellucci vehicle Beetlejuice 2, for no reason other than I want to watch a Monica Bellucci movie and I don't want to watch a bad one. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, let's move on. Uh, John, um, could you explain a little bit about what ASAT does, what it is, and uh, your role in it? Sure, sure. So... Um... ASAT is the American Studies Association of Texas. Uh, there is a national organization called American Studies Association. And then you have numerous branch associations, uh, you know, across the country. Um, what it does is it, uh, it it's a multidisciplinary association that looks at uh, America through numerous lenses. Um, it, American literature for one, American cinema for another, American history, American law. Um, like I said, it's it, it's absolutely interdisciplinary. So um, we get a lot of interesting uh, proposals for paper topics. Um, we we since we are located in Texas, we ask that um, the people consider. Uh, Texas or the South or the Southwest uh, in relation to their project, you know, to try to get a, a connection to us 
specifically. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's been around since I want to say 1956, 1957. We've been around for a goodly number of years. Um, I, I'm the most recent president. Uh, I first started going to ASAT conferences down at uh, Sam Houston in Huntsville when I first came here. Uh, Todd Giles said, my first semester, he said, oh, you got to go down here. It's just a couple hours down the road. It's more than a couple it's hours. <laughs> But it's just a couple hours down the road. It's it's a wonderful, friendly conference, and um, and and I've been going back ever since. It, it really is a, a a nice personal conference. You don't get lost. You don't get overwhelmed. Uh, people are very friendly and willing to to meet people that they don't know, uh, rather than just kind of coming in and doing their bit and disappearing. Um, which happens with larger national conferences, you know. And I love the interdisciplinary of it because mm -hmm. you, you can the, the the subjects that range from anything. I mean, it's it's a huge Absolutely. variety of, of 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 papers or lectures that you can attend, and they're all different and all fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, history, law enforcement. We actually have a uh, proposal from uh, a mechanical engineer. You, you know, I, I haven't read it yet, but I know it's there. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's that's an interesting one. So uh, I submitted my proposal on Friday. Yeah, yeah, I got yours. Uh, you're doing you one with, with Peter. Peter. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, like I said, I I'm just he was a little worried because he's like, "Where's the American in this?" I go, "Because we're critiquing American scholarship." He goes, "Okay, fair enough. That that worked." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we had a a, a wonderful. Uh, piece in JSAT, which is the Journal of American Studies Association, Texas. Um, and, and it was about, um, well, racism uh, towards Mexicans post-World War II in Texas. So, um, no, and, you know, I say Mexican Mexicans, but there were actually uh, Mexican-Americans who had served in the armed forces and defended our country in Europe. And um, their welcome home wasn't all that great. Uh, so it was it, it was a wonderful essay uh, about the trials and tribulations of, of, of that period of time. And, you know, it's kind of a, a dark thing to talk about, but, you know. Uh, and submissions are due when? Uh, they're they're open year round. Okay. Yeah. So even if you don't make it this year, you'll be able to make it for next year. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm just saying because I've, I've this will be my third lecture I've done, and there are loads of fun. Mm -hmm. Now submissions for the conference or yeah. sub okay. no submissions for the conference. Okay, so submissions for the conference are due by the end of September. Okay. Because I do have to figure out the schedule for everybody and all that, yeah. uh, and send out you know, acceptance notices so people can make travel arrangements uh, sure. with, with plenty of time. So I, I figured six weeks was more than ample. And so I figured the 1st of October, since we're mid-November for the conference, that, that should be good. Oh, and also for uh, anybody listening who's, you know, considering uh, submitting a proposal, an abstract, uh, we do offer travel grants that uh, will help defray the cost of uh, participating and traveling to the conference. It's not enough to pay for everything, but uh, registration fee is 75, membership fee is 15, so that's like 90. And then you can get a hotel for about 100 a night around here. So, um, And the, the travel grants do go up to $200. So that can kind of take care of your lodging and your registration. So all you would have to do is pay for gas and pay for your food um, and come and have a wonderful time with us. Yeah. Oh, speaking of, I, I should also mention uh, our keynote speaker. Can I go ahead and go ahead. put in a, uh, a plug for this? So this guy, uh, his name is uh, Jake Tall. Jake Toll, excuse me, Drake Toll, D-R-A-K-E-C Toll, T 
T-O-L-L. And he is a, uh, well, he does a podcast too. Oh. Yes, he does uh, Locked on Big 12. He does a sports podcast. Uh, have you all ever heard of Banana Ball? Banana Ball? Banana Ball. No. Have you ever heard of the Savannah Bananas? Yes. <laughs> The crazy baseball team. Crazy baseball team, yeah. Yes, that's banana ball. Okay. So the Savannah Bananas are a crazy baseball team. They play like 18 games a season. It's like the Harlem Globetrotters, but for baseball. Oh, okay. Yes. And they they do all these crazy things with, you know, batters on stilts, you know, um, and I, yeah. People do flips while running the bases. It, it it's outrageous. It's very entertaining. A lot of them are in costumes, you know, all sorts. Yeah, of Yeah, things. yeah. So so Drake uh, is a broadcaster um, for this organization, but he's also with the uh, uh, he's with the other team, uh, the Monkeys. What is it? Uh, no, uh, Party Animals. You know, you likened it to the Harlem Globetrotters. Yeah. So who did the Harlem Globetrotters play? I forget their names. The Washington the Generals. Generals. Right. Yes. So, you know, when you have a show-off team, they have to play against somebody. So he, he's part of the uh, Party Animals, which is the opposing team. But it's it, it's very entertaining. He wears this uh, – here, I've got a picture of it. I don't know if I can show it to you. But he's got this wonderful, like uh, – Cruella DeVille mink coat kind of thing going on. Yeah. Can you imagine wearing that in Savannah (laughs) during the summer baseball season? (laughs) So imagine like starting starting to run and then just disintegrating. Good Lord. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So he's, uh, but like I said, he's more of a broadcaster uh, than actually on the field. Yeah. Uh, But yeah, he's a graduate of Baylor uh, journalism school and uh he's been doing this for a couple of years now and uh a good friend of mine over at baylor uh cassie burleson uh connected us sounds like a great keynote speaker oh yeah and in terms of marketing this this guy's got it going on (laughs) (laughs) uh he is if you're wondering he is for those of you watching uh the youtube he is pointing to our new uh coordinator of outreach for the library uh Mateo. 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 We're not gonna force you to come in th- and say hi on this one, but uh yeah, he's he's in there listening in. I, w- I was wondering, I came by, I saw him, and I was like, what? I'm boring. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah, one of these days. One of these days, but not today. Um, um but, yeah. But yeah, so Ryan, how long have you been um attending ASAT? Well, um, as as some of you know, I am I am Todd Giles emotional support librarian. So he has required me to travel with him several times because he likes going every year. I have not gone every year. I, I've gone three times now. Um, this will be my fourth uh, time attending. Um, but yeah, it's. Uh, I think I started it in 2016, 2018, sometime around yeah. there. Yeah. Um, first one I did was about the... Um, the various ages of um, superhero comic books. Um, I remember that one. The one I did back in 2021, 20, 22, was on um, the history of um, tabletop role-playing games. Mm. And this year I'm planning on doing something on um, American scholarship of Hiro Miyazaki and how it's all wrong. <laughs> you were on a panel with uh, Chris Morrow. Was I? Okay. Yeah, tabletop games. Yeah, yeah. That was the one here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he did the first, uh, the first part of it, and I did the second yeah. part of it, and then we talked. Chris was down at Tarleton. He was the chair of the department down at Tarleton. Now he's, I think he's dean. Wow. Down at uh, Permian Basin, UT okay. Permian Basin. Just got the job down there. Yeah, he covered. Um, some various different tabletop games and how they work and yeah. stuff like that. And I did more of a, a history of how um, all the things that lead up to role-playing games, basically. Mm-hmm. By the way, uh, I'm going to uh, unfortunately have to uh, steal the spotlight from Joe, but when he's doing the um, 
the uh, upcoming events at the uh, at the end of the podcast. But uh, we have a date for the library's tabletop terror. The library gaming club has a board game night. We're actually going to be doing that on uh, October thirtieth. So this first time that we've actually done this while the library was open. So it's going to be interesting. But I have a. Uh, I, I'm very excited to see how it's going to turn out. But uh, what, since you're talking about board games now, I'm just I just thought like, oh yeah, that's right. We literally just got that sorted out in the last week. Not to still be the Halloween spotlight. themed. It is well, it wasn't first, and they do um, they do have uh, prize handouts for um, like a, a costume contest, which we're also doing with the event that Joe is putting together or has put sort of putting together. Had his first event last year, uh, Rooftop Heroes. So, um, yeah, come to the library around Halloween, and there's going to be some kind of costume contest and uh, prizes and all kinds of other things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they it's it's kind of, it started off as kind of more Halloween themed, but as it's grown, like it's kind of just become like um, there's a I wow well, I'm I'm going to embarrass myself horribly right now, but there's a um, gaming type um association that i think is from maybe dallas that has helped with um with sponsorship for for some of that for the, the last two years and hopefully they'll be able to come and, and do it again this year but yeah they um uh since since it's kind of gotten bigger and bigger like the turnout's gotten gotten a lot better too even though we've only had these things on fridays and only after hours like people really like this is the one of the golden age of uh of board games right now i think because people are really really into them it's a really it's a really big communal thing much more so than it was when when i was younger it's because you could go to a bar when you were younger oh <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah that's that's true yeah um but things have changed yeah it's like um I, I feel like that kind of the the bar the whole kind of you know whatever that kind of communal experience has has um kind of transferred yeah it's yeah. it's gone over to, to these more like these gaming type events almost yeah yeah, yeah. There, there's a uh there's a place over in uh in, in the mall that hosts uh D, D on thursday nights oh yeah yeah my daughter goes over there every... <laughs> she, she was hanging out in ihop until one o'clock uh last week because she, she met these folks and she did the D and D thing. And then, you know, they're hanging out afterwards and just talking and talking and talking. And they migrated over to IHOP to <laughs> get something to eat. I just want to say, this is the weirdest thing in the world for me. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm fairly old. I'm gen X. You did not admit liking D and D when I was a kid. If you did, oh. you got shoved into a, into a locker, a locker or, yeah. you know, <laughs> or something like that. And so when the first time I went to ASAT, one of the things I mentioned is, oh, yeah, I have a weekly gaming group. And all these professors are like, oh, my God, you were the coolest person ever. And <laughs> logically, I knew they weren't lying to me. But but that little voice in the back of my head is saying, they're trying to trick you. They're trying to trick you. No one likes no one likes ulterior you. motives. <laughs> Where's the locker? Where's the locker? I know there's a locker around here somewhere. <laughs> um, but Yeah, that's the weirdest thing is I like Ryan. Ryan's mentioned that and. For me, it was like mid high, mid high school, where it was you don't talk about things like like the games that you're into, and then like halfway through, it was everyone decided to get into Magic: The Gathering. Yeah, and that was it was like a a switch flipped, and suddenly everything was cool. And I was because it wasn't like where Ryan's now, where it's like the the youth are strange. <laughs> For me, it was like the people around me are strange because my stuff is normal. Yeah, and that's not supposed to be happening. I'm 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 the niche one over here. That's so strange, but it all happened in real time. Yeah. yeah. Well, another thing as well is when I was in college, I was part of the um, Jap Animation because it was called that before it was called Anime mm. uh, Club. And um, at some point in the last twenty years, I have been surpassed because I used to be the anime an anime guy. No, I am. <laughs> 15 years ago, I stopped being the anime yeah. anime guy. I'm not anime at all anymore. I read this manga called D. Gray Man. It's, all, it's 30 volumes long. I read it in uh, four days because it was so good. This was that actually no, that was what I wanted to talk about in the last in the last podcast when we had Peter Fields on, and everyone uh, steamrolled me. 
But that's because uh, you and Peter love talking. So, <laughs> and this is only supposed to be an hour long. <laughs> it's amazing that most of them are are right there in an hour, though. Honestly, so with with ASAT materials, do they are they published? Uh, well, it can be published in JSAT, which is the journal oh, okay. for the organization. Okay, okay. Right. So uh, now, generally, there's a difference between conference papers and the papers that you would get published. Okay. Um, so conference papers, you know, because of your time limit are roughly, you know, nine, 10 pages uh, max, you know, because you want about 15 minutes or so with, with about five minutes after for Q&A, right? Uh, but for the papers that we publish, we want something a little meatier, uh, at, at least 15 pages or so to, you know, 20 pages in, in that neighborhood. So you know, you could definitely uh, fill it out. It's interesting. Some people do their paper. Some people talk about the paper they've done. Yeah. Some people talk about research they're doing. And some people, I remember RJ last year, Robert Johnson, one of our um, mm -hmm. previous um, um, English professors, just basically stood up and said, hey, I'm watching this new uh, television show that's based off a book and I want to talk about it for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> and he did. And it was it was fascinating. So, um, yeah, there's all types of, of, of presentations that are done. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, just getting up and reading a paper can be kind of dry. So, you know, we're, mm, we're open yeah. to a variety of presentations. Mm. Uh, some people have, you know, full-on PowerPoints and videos and... Other people are just, well, like RJ, you know, <laughs> no paper at all. They're just going to get up and talk. <laughs> well, shoot, I should do that. I can get up and talk about nonsense for <laughs> two hours. No, it's got to be focused nonsense. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it goes on um, your CV. I mean, might as well. Might as well. <laughs> um, but that kind of reminds me, though. I mean, it's a it's a, a totally different thing. But I did want to talk to you, uh, John, about um, this podcast in particular. I don't know if you remember this. You might. I think we might have brought it up before. But um, when I first got here, I had this idea for a book club. Um, and, that, and that went nowhere. Because who, who reads anymore, aside from you know, all of us. But um, now, honestly, though, we were we were really struggling to find like a specific voice for it. Ironically, with, with you have a, a magazine called Voices. So we we were looking for our our voice with this um, with this uh, book club. And it kind of became something different. Um, and someone who really helped us out with it a lot also was uh, Jeffrey Clegg, who was on the podcast a few months ago. Um, uh, and what we came down there for that was like, well, maybe the library can be like an open forum. Maybe it can be somewhere where someone can talk. It doesn't necessarily have to be about a book. It doesn't necessarily have to be a book club. Maybe it could be just a place to have an open discussion. And I like to think that this podcast, as a result of, of that, has kind of jumped into something that's been um, kind of our own voice. Because we've been doing this for like three years now, and I don't see us stopping it anytime soon. But it's... it's um, kind of wonderful what it's become and uh kind of weird that we've only just now got you on here but yeah i wanted to just say that this is um if not for your input if this might have been something completely different happy to help <laughs> <laughs> boom got it and by input you mean oh no no one reads anymore you don't want to do a book club. <laughs> that's exactly what it was but yeah <laughs> yeah you, you know i mean th there are people who read uh and, and amazingly enough, there are people who admit to not reading in a creative writing class. I've, I've, had, I've had students, yeah, I don't read that much. And, you know, I, I really don't write that much either. <laughs> you know, why are you here? But, you know, it's creative writing. I figured it'd be fun. It's like, okay. I mean, unless your name is Cormac McCarthy, you can't really say I want to write and I don't read. Because he famously did that all the time. He was like, I don't, I don't read. I don't care. I don't care about reading. And then he just casually dropped this like masterpiece out of nowhere. But yeah, generally, if you're looking to start writing, you, you probably need to read a few things. Just a few. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you also have people like George R. R. Martin who hates to write, who's actually done pretty well as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on. Ju just a page a day, George. <laughs> Keep it going. Keep it going. Keep it. No, he's actually, he's, he's, he's. 
he said outright that he hates writing, but he only did it for the money. There was a conversation with him <laughs> and great. Stephen King where he he addressed how King and um we talked about this with, with Peter Fields, I believe, last time, but but uh, he has a, a wonderful nonfiction book called On Writing. Anyone yeah. who's interested in just the the idea of creative writing real or creativity at all needs to read this book. It's it's a, a fantastic thing. But um in that he talked about how at the very least he starts the day and like his job is writing a thousand words. Like a thousand words, that's the minimum. And then like if he wants to write more, he does, but otherwise, like that's how he keeps his pace going. And he does that every single day. And um yeah, Martin asked him, like, how do you do it? How do you force yourself to write? And King's response, I believe, was just like, because it's it's in my blood. It's what I do. It is what I do as a person is right. Mm -hmm. So for, for George R. R. Martin to be that, where everyone's waiting with bated breath for him to release not even the last book of his his magnum opus is just so strange to me. How, how, hard, uh, how hard could it be? <laughs> well, I, you know, I can kind of understand the pressure especially when the HBO series caught up mm -hmm. yeah. uh, to what he had already published. And then, you know, there's what he wants to do. And then there's what the showrunners decide to do with his characters. Uh, yeah. I mean, I can, I, I can see how that would put a damper on the spirit. Especially well, as I mean, when I everyone hates time. it. <laughs> and as I mentioned, I think last time is um, he's managed to get a foothold into writing the, the Bibles for um, fantasy role-playing games online. And that just lets him come up with like interesting text and interesting ideas. He doesn't have to sit there and compose right. at all. And the composing, as we all know, is the tough uh. part. Is it's, it's coming up with the ideas isn't necessarily the hard part. The hard part is stringing it all together yeah. over 800 yeah. pages. Yeah. 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 And whenever you have 60 plot points that all need to come together to one little point, like that's like, I, I, I'm being facetious. I really do think that he's, he's, gotten to uh, a very very complex novel i don't know how he could possibly write his way into what what hbo did there but well i hate to tell you guys but he's not going to he's not going to that's what, no no no. don't don't hate to tell us because we we know yeah it's we're, gonna we're be okay ghostwritten by somebody at some point but that's be after he's gone well let's hope the ending is better than the hbo <laughs> series yeah I, that that ending was so disappointing for me it was like no <laughs> well again i think i've mentioned this before on the show but um in the 80s george R. R. martin was my favorite writer of all time mm. once he started game of thrones he stopped being my favorite writer because he completely dropped uh something called a thousand worlds uh uh universe okay. which was his science fiction universe and that's what i was really interested in oh, the thousand okay. world stuff yeah and he recently mentioned in a in an interview where basically took questions from the crowd one person said Are you ever going to return the thousand worlds universe and he goes what's the thousand worlds what's that oh your science fiction stuff oh i don't know i throw all that stuff away <laughs> that's crazy well um yeah, that's... and I still hate him for that reason. I refuse to read <laughs> Game of Thrones because he, of that. he knows he can feel it in the air. I don't. I don't know how anybody could throw their stuff away. I mean, it, even if you know your stuff isn't all that great, you know, why would you throw it away? Well, it was all his go... notes and all that type of stuff. He moved yeah. on to something else, but yeah, no, I well, move on to other stuff too. But I don't throw it away. To go back to Stephen King, he has a few short stories that he's disavowed and he's asked his publisher to remove. Um, one of them is Rage, which is... Isabella, yeah. Yeah, Rage. Um, that one, he's just said, like, I don't know what I was thinking writing it. I'm ashamed of writing well, it. I hate to think that it's influenced anyone in the world at um, all in any shooters, way. Yeah. So, well, <laughs> since that book was actually found in the back pocket of a rather famous school of one of the uh, one of the um, one of the shooters of a very famous school, school shooting. That's why he got stopped doing yeah, that one because was... uh, the, they said that they were directly influenced by by that work. Yeah, and that's going to be um, horrific for you. It's a it's a Bachman book, and I think we have a copy yeah. of it. But yeah, it's one of the ones that he's like he's never wanted it to be reprinted because just just the shame of it all. But I'm uh, surprised he hasn't also done that with the Running Man because that ends with someone hijacking an aircraft. Uh, aircraft oh God! Yeah, flying it um, into a in, flying it into a building. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> well, who knows? I I don't know. Like he has so many works. I like. I'm sure he's like that. Where he's like, I don't remember. I don't remember ever being involved with writing that. 
Yeah, and the, and the story in Running Man was so much darker than the movie. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. I love his Bachman books. I mean, yeah. th that's just me. I think The Long Walk, which is the first novel he ever wrote, is really his his strongest piece. It, it's very raw, it's very open, and it's about death. It's about mortality. Yeah. yeah. Walking until you can't walk anymore? They're supposedly going to make a, um, a high-budget... Um, television series based off really? the book finally now for years um he's opened he's, he's let people filmmakers he's told them filmmakers are free to adapt any of my short stories they want to as long as it's a student film and it's not for profit so there have been renditions of the long walk made but they're all student films mm -hmm. interesting mm -hmm. i think that's cool too that he does something like that he says yeah. if you want to do one of my short stories absolutely you can but it can't be again can't be for profit yeah. And it's it's a student film, basically. Yeah, but I mean, they could use it to enter a contest. Sure, right here. You know, I mean, the, I only scholarship or something. I only know this because of Stephen King film festivals. One of the things they usually show at the film festivals all these various student films mm. that have been done over the years based on his work. Awesome. I think it is awesome too. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember? Well, we are sorry. We we started this late, so I'm not really sure what you, what time it even is. We're oh, kind we still of got about 15 to, minutes. Um, yeah. What's that? We still have about 15 minutes. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. Thank goodness. Um, We're kind of wandering. That's all also bad because now I've all right. now now I've run out of things to say. <laughs> so now we can just talk about Stephen King for the next fifteen minutes. I guess that'd be good. Maybe I'm actually a writer. It fits. I, I've never actually read a whole lot of his stuff. Actually, this will be the second podcast in a row where we're talking about this this ultra famous author. Where I'm like, I've well, everything's by. I view Stephen King as sort of Charles Dickens. He is a very much a populist writer um, who. Um, has some scholarship behind. I mean, he has some he has some some meat behind his work that can be that can be analyzed, much like I think Dickens, Charles Dickens was in a similar right. type of uh um because I remember reading Charles Dickens when I was in high school and going, This guy's a hack. He's writing soap operas. What the heck? Yeah, yeah. But that's <laughs> what was selling. Yeah, you know, it, it was all serialized. So you know, I, <laughs> we we call out soap operas because of the cliffhanger it said yep, at yep, the yep, end yep, of yep, each, yep. you know, be scene. Yep. Yeah, and, and and it all comes from that. Yeah. You know, I mean, that that whole serialization thing kind of dictated that yeah. you, you got to leave people thirsty for next week's installment. Exactly. Yeah. But the funny thing is, I read that when I was a kid, and I'm like, this is one of the great works out there. This reads like a soap opera. What, yeah. What is yeah. this? Anyway. But that's well, I, I think also someone like someone like Charles Dickens and also someone like Stephen King existed in a, in a just a time in, in fiction writing history that's not going to come back anymore. Like especially Charles Dickens, like you said, he, he wrote a bunch of serialized stuff. King, a lot of his early works were serialized. Like yeah. that's how he got his start. And like even then, like on writing, he talks about like if you want to learn the craft, you need to write the short story and you need oh, yeah, to figure yeah. out the. Yeah, you need you need to figure out how to do the pacing, the plot points. Mm -hmm. Like a a novel is a short story writ large. So that that's yes. one of my complaints about modern writing is a lot of them have not gotten their start through short stories. So if, if there's one thing short stories it lets it makes it forces you to do is really focus on what's important because you have mm -hmm. so few words to to explain your idea. It has to be really tight. There can't be any extraneous material in there. It's got to be it's got to be to the point. It's got to be concise. It's got to be well put together. And I think I think he's absolutely right. Um, that's why I always gravitate to short story writers more so than other writers. I hate the long, never ending series, which has become the popular thing nowadays. Uh, I, I thought you were going to make an allusion to Infinite Jest or something. <laughs> infinite. I mean, if you go to my house, I, my row, I have row upon row of anthologies is what I have on, yeah. on, on my bookshelf. But it's not just that it makes for like it it, it really does help to I, when I was in college I, I took creative writing I had a few stories published in a college paper and I always wanted to write fiction but having actually finished my first fiction novel like a few years ago I was like I don't I don't know if I have that in me anymore <laughs> like it's it's just such a like you really do need oh, yeah. to practice that crap and it's something that's it's like it, it's not like riding a bike you know you don't just remember it like it's something that you had to practice every day you're like um like I, I mentioned to someone the other day like um um like playing an instrument you know you have to practice or your chops get rusty it's, it's the same exact concept there mm -hmm. but um 
that not only that, but also having that knowledge of how to write a short story keeps it to where your own works of fiction will constantly be having like action in some way. Like, like, you know how to keep an action flowing and keeping it going for like every 15, 20 pages or whatever, however long you're, you're used to writing your chapters or your stories. Yeah, a lot of the uh, short stories that my students turn in are actually the beginnings of novels. <laughs> That's you know, and, and you know, I I I do make the point. It's like, okay, I want you to turn in a story, something with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Mm -hmm. And you know, beginnings are easy. Well, well here's the thing, though, know. too, is <laughs> some of the great stories out there began as short stories. Um, so oh, it's yeah. very easy to take an idea because that's all a short story is. You're basically presenting an idea. It's easy to fill that out and extend that into an actual story. Yeah, and like, like I just off the top of my head, thinking about like Flowers for Algernon. Like when I think of that work, I think of the short story, and most people think, of, like a lot of people think of the book. I think of the short story, like off well, the top of my head. Again, doing more science fiction is very popular in science fiction. Dune started off as a short story. Oh yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Ender's Game started off as a short story. Um, yeah, but with Flowers with Algernon, because he goes from one state to a highly intelligent state and then back, you, you kind of need the length. I agree. To, yeah. To kind of get that transition. Yeah. And that yeah. was actually, I'm glad that you use that as a visual example, because that's like you, you look at a story and you look at the action plotted out as a story and it's that it's, the, you got to have the. Denouement. That denouement. Yeah. The, the denouement. Uh, yeah. falling action at the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, you also have to come up with a good story and, um, one of the things that we frequently talk about in class is the scope of the story that you want to tell. You know, George R. R. Martin, his scope is, you know, yeah. it's, it's enormous, you know, 60 plot points. I was like, no, keep it simple. Keep it down to something very doable in, in 10 pages. And it's difficult to come up with an idea that, that you can address yeah. and complete in such a small period of time. But that's exactly what you have to do if you want to write something longer, right? Because you have to be able to discern how big of an idea is this? Am I going to write a poem? Am I going to write a short story? Or is this going to be a multi-volume series? You know? Yeah. And again, uh, I I have a lot of disrespect to multi-volume series because really what they are is publishers know they sell well and it's mm, about the money. Yep. That's why there's so many series out there that have gone on far longer than they should have in their, and it's, they're just simply milking just it. milking it, exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. Well, a, a Song of Ice and Fire was supposed to be a trilogy. Like it's it's beyond double the point that he was supposed to have written it before. And like, what does he have to show for it? A TV show that was really popular and no one likes talking about it anymore. Um, like, spoilers, Joe, I know you're doing Wheel of Time. Wheel of Time is infamous for that. Um, I forget what book it is, but at some point it begins, it becomes quite obvious that he is just stalling the ending. Uh, well, the the 80th time Nynaeve twists her hair uh, in a chapter, that's when you're like, okay. Okay. Um, specifically with Wheel of Time, what happened is the original author died. Yeah. I'm aware and of that as well, but he was also extending it before that. <laughs> I, I don't disagree with you. Um, the the books that were co-authored by another person and end the series are my least favorite books in the series. Uh, they're, they don't have the same tone. They don't have the same voice. Uh, and it's so obviously not the same. And I have to wonder if you know, so, somewhat like the 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 change of authorship going from book to TV that happened with Game of Thrones, if there was not a somewhat vast change of of intent, um, yeah, that 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 is that is well, problematic. We best stop there, otherwise I'm gonna go on a rant about Brian Herbert. But 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 <laughs> Joe Brandon Sanderson's magic systems i don't care i don't either. Um, i hate it i, I don't care well, the the okay here's the thing by the way we do this all the time 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is a po- this is our podcast. The, the uh I was given as a gift by someone who loves me a copy of Stephen King's book on writing. And I was given that book because that person knows me to be a person who writes. I am a writer. I have not read that book. I have had that book on my shelf for multiple years, and I have not read it. I mean, there could be a you know, handwritten check for $10,000 in there, and I've never seen it. <laughs> I've never read that book. Um, part of the reason for that is I don't care. And what I mean by that is, is that other people cannot tell you how to do the thing that you love to do. Mm-hmm. Also, specifically, other people cannot tell you how to do a thing that is normal and natural to you. There's a thing, and and like I understand the difference between Martin and King and why they had this clash of ideas about what writing is. Now, I have to say that part of that is because King, in his career now, is a writer. That's what he does. When he was working three part-time jobs, I don't know if he was writing a thousand words every day. I'm sure he had some kind of a routine, but as a as a person whose job it is to write, of course he can have a different view of writing than someone who's doing a full-time job and a part-time job and is trying to write the great American novel on the weekends and during their bathroom breaks. It's a very different thing. Mm-hmm. Having said that though, there are people who can walk into a kitchen that only has ingredients in it and create meals. There are people who cannot create a meal unless the meal is already there. Unless they're presented with a Lunchable, they can't stack crackers and cheese together, mm-hmm. okay? There are people who cannot follow the directions on a on a box of hamburger helper or, you know, a Kraft macaroni and cheese. They just can't Cheers. do it. Okay. So there's that vast array of difference, and that applies to all kinds of things. There are people that can pick up instrument musical instruments they've never seen and pick them up and get a good tune coming out of them. There are people who can study for a year and not get chopsticks out of it. Sometimes it helps if you have a piano and not a harmonica, but still, you know. Uh so it it it's not the same and the and you can't be told how to do it now i understand you can say okay a good idea might be to outline might be to do these things and that might be a good step and you say okay i understand what you're talking about i'm not going to do that <laughs> and you don't have to yeah. okay there's so many different writers who are really really famous not necessarily popular, but really, really famous, and have made a bunch of money off of their books. And their writing is not the same. You cannot compare Tom Clancy and J.D. Robb, not in a way that makes sense. And honestly, of those two, having read both, I like J.D. Robb better, and I don't like Robb that much. I hate (laughs) Clancy's books. Every, Every film adaptation of a Clancy book is better than the paper. Everyone, everyone. Yeah. Well, um, since since we're um, kind of kind of now short on time, now, now I do want to <laughs> say I don't think that you should read it, but I I can very quickly surmise uh, King's advice in that book, and it's write a lot and don't use adverbs. Yeah, the rest that's of good. it is is nonfiction autobiography. <laughs> that's not a book about the process of writing. It's about I hate adverbs and I write all the time. And here's my life story. Right. Now I, I, I share his his uh, feelings about adverbs, and, and I insist on that in my class as well. I don't mind but adverbs. They're, I kinda... they're confused. They they totally are. Uh, but getting back to Joseph's point, you know about how you write. Everybody writes in their own style and their their own method um what i always tell my students is you have to figure out what works for you 
it, you can be one of those people that write a thousand words each day and that's fine if that works for you you can be the person who doesn't write anything for a month and then sits down and writes 20 pages if that works for you great um and, and the two authors that i mentioned are uh Catherine ann porter and el doctra so Catherine ann porter used to say that she would never start a story unless she knew the ending so she would work her way to the ending. I'm a lot like that. She she already knew it, right? And and so that that was a method that worked for her. El Dotro said, uh, "Writing is like driving at night in the fog. You can only see as far as your headlights will allow, but you can make the whole trip that way. So you don't need to know the ending. You just need to know what's next." Mm -hmm. That's how I start the, the one book that I wrote. That's exactly how I did it. Um, I, I started writing it. I had a plan. Like I had a plan for like the very, like kind of broad strokes of it. And then as I wrote it, I was like, Oh, well my next draft, I'm going to have to erase literally half of the book because it came out differently from where, where I planned it. And, and I wrote the, like some of the last chapters first, because those are the ones that stuck out of my head. I was like, okay, I, I know this is where I'm going to go with it. By the time I got there, I was like, well, it, it, didn't, it wasn't even remotely close to that. So second draft, just rewrite it again. Just keep doing it. Um, um, but everyone has a different method. Absolutely. A different voice, too. I hate to interrupt, but we're going over. Um, yep. <laughs> Joe, what's going on this week? Yeah, Joe. Okay. Hit it, Joe. All right. Uh, okay. Events happening on campus and in our community. Uh, Stage 2 Dinner Theater is performing the magnificent play Steel Magnolias. Wichita Theater is doing the stage version of Disney's Beauty and the Beast. Uh, the first teaching and learning resource collaborative workshop of the fall will be from 4 to 530 this Thursday, September 12th, here in the Moffat Library Atrium. Uh, all faculty should make plans to attend this workshop to participate in community and develop your pedagogy. The workshop is titled WAC, W-A-C, is writing across the curriculum happening in your classroom. On Saturday, September 14th, the Wichita Falls Museum of Art at MSU Texas will host an opening reception for the Birds in Art exhibition, which will be on display through December 7th. Uh, in conjunction with the Birds in Art exhibition, the WFMA will host a workshop on making felted birds from 5.30 to 7 on September 12th, and from 2 to 4 on September 21st. The downtown Wichita Falls Farmer's Market is hosting Taco Fest on September 21st. And also on September 21st, uh, Backdoor Theater will be having an evening of improv. Please join our friends down at Backdoor. Downtown Wichita Falls Farmer's Market will host the next After Hours Art Walk on October 3rd. Rooftop Heroes, our pop culture mini convention celebrating fictional heroes in all their forms, will return for its second year at Moffat Library on Thursday, October 31st. We will have speakers and presentations all afternoon and a costume contest to close out the event. We'll have a vendor area with student organizations, uh, including MSU Texas Esports and Gaming. We'll have campus artists displaying their work for more information on participation, please call 940-397-4091 or email joseph.mcneely at msutexas.edu. And then in November, Moffat Library will be celebrating Children's Book Week with daily readings at 4, Monday, November 4th through Sunday, November 10th. If you'd like more information about the things I mentioned today and other local activities, you can check out the events section of the MSU Texas homepage and the calendar at discoverwichitafalls.com slash events. Back to you, Chris. All right. Uh, if we are all done there, I think we've got a podcast. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us, John. Hope to talk to you again very soon in the future. Thank you. And for, for everyone else out there, we'll see you around. All right.